Hi, I'm Dr. Walt Medlin, and welcome to our temporary update for our information session for Bariatric Medicine Institute. Thanks for your attention today, and we hope to get this replaced with a uh, more professional version soon, uh, but we needed to update our information uh, sooner. So uh, first, I just wanted to say that uh, in terms of who we are, we are three surgeons that are dedicated to the care of diabetes and uh, diseases related to obesity. We are general surgeons and we have a large team uh, including uh, nursing care, dietitian, exercise specialist, and uh, insurance and administrative specialist to help you. So we are one big uh, group that all work together. Um, we're committed to quality uh, surgical care. We're also committed to um, teaching and research. Uh, and we are advocates for the best, most safe, and affordable care for patients. Um, Bariatric Medicine Institute, Dr. Christina Richards, Dr. Daniel Cottam, myself, Dr. Walt Medlin. Uh, we operate primarily at City Creek Surgical Center, which is uh, connected to our office uh, in Salt Lake City. We also operate across the street uh, at Salt Lake Regional Medical Center and at um, uh, LDS uh, Hospital. Uh, in uh, the avenues in Salt Lake City. Um, we also do uh, operate uh, in coordination with the program uh, in Pocatello, Idaho at Portneuf Medical Center. And we have offices, uh, first of all, our primary office, Bariatric Medicine Institute itself, it's uh, Salt Lake City, uh, 1046 East 100 South. We also have uh, part-time offices in Draper and Layton and Elko, Nevada. Uh, and I do see patients uh, uh, in the... Um, hospital as a clinic visit in Pocatello. So let's talk quickly about obesity and what we mean when we talk about obesity. First of all, it's a loaded word and it's very judgmental in our society, but excess weight is usually caused by a problem of energy storage and that is also related to hunger. And a lot of people can lose weight uh, many times during their life, but they can't keep it off because the body reacts by increasing hunger and by slowing down metabolism. And so diets work while you're on them, but they don't last for more than two years. Usually uh, weight loss uh, is gone. So bariatric surgery or metabolic surgery works by changing the body's response to hunger. And as you lose weight, your hunger doesn't increase. Uh, and in fact, it decreases a lot because of surgery. And that's a long-term decrease. So um, in terms of the direct effect, why we call it metabolic surgery, metabolism refers to those diseases with diabetes with sugar and especially with cholesterol and those things that lead to heart disease. And that's a direct effect even without the change in weight. But both together give a really great benefit uh, for diabetes and heart disease risk factors also. And then you'll see in the slides afterwards, there's a lot of other uh, risks that are improved uh, after surgery, especially cancer risk reduces. So when we talk about obesity, we usually use the term body mass index, which is basically something you can just plug into a calculator online that measures your relative weight to your height. Now that's an outdated term scientifically, but we still use it because we don't have a really good replacement. But you should know that you don't just look up your weight online uh, for your body mass index and then make a decision purely based on that. You can come and see us for a consultation. We uh, work beyond BMI for, uh, for body, beyond body mass index for uh, talking with patients one-on-one -on -one about their health risks and their goals. Uh, this is not really a disease of behavior, but behavior obviously results from hunger and we are in an environment where food is very much pushed on us and delicious and hard to say no to. So there's behaviors involved and exercise uh, does get harder as we age and definitely we live in an age of convenience where we exercise less, but it's not a primary disease of behavior. All right, so bottom line is obesity for us and surgically approachable is treatable but not curable. And I think that is one other component that you need to just remember long term that there's really, this is not an easy way out. It's for most people the only way out and it still does require work and it is not, uh, it's not a cheat. Um, so we offer uh, surgery and medical care from patients even from their preteens into their 80s. We offer behavior and medication options. Uh, there are many other providers uh, around who offer medication options, not as many who offer uh, surgery as part of a, 
uh, comprehensive or combined program. We also do offer medications even for people who've had surgery who need a little extra help. These, some of these hunger pathways uh, are best addressed with combination care. We have mental health support and definitely stress in all of our lives is a component of eating. Even our skinny friends uh, have those issues. Uh, we have a dietitian uh, and other uh, care specialists for exercise physiology, uh, for mental health support, uh, nurses. Um, we do um, primarily two operations these days. We also do revision surgery for people who have had uh, older operations and need an update uh, or who uh, need additional care. Um, so. Uh, Cost for surgery for patients who have to pay out of pocket is usually eight to fifteen thousand dollars, depending on what we're doing. Uh, with insurance, um, copays are um, uh, usually what they are for your regular insurance, but sometimes the the delay can take uh, several months to qualify to get uh, authorization for surgery. So be prepared for that. We do almost all of our operations these days laparoscopically, which is through tiny incisions uh, where we can put little. Uh, thin pencil thin instruments uh, through. Uh, one incision is usually about a half an inch to uh, three quarters of an inch long. Uh, we almost never make a big incision anymore like for old school surgery, but if we have to, that's certainly an option for safety. Uh, but very rare, even for revision surgery, do we have to do that. So our two main operations uh, basically are very closely related. The first is sleeve gastrectomy, and that is basically just taking the stomach uh, drawing out the stomach and the small bowel and a little bit of the colon or large bowel here. Uh, the, the stomach is all we operate on for sleeve gastrectomy. And that's what I had 10 years ago. I'm a sleeve patient myself. And that is literally just taking this football shaped stomach and turning it into sort of a banana shaped stomach or it's a, it's a, it's a sleeve resection, not a, it's not a crossway resection. It's a lengthwise uh, removal of about two thirds or three quarters of the stomach. So this part actually comes out, that part of my stomach is gone, uh, and I have a stomach that is shaped uh, more like a tube now. It's not just a matter of making a smaller stomach and feeling full faster though. There are hunger signal, hunger hormones that are made in this part of the stomach that are changed by having that part of the stomach removed. There are also signals from downstream in the small bowel that are um, changed because the stomach empties differently. Uh, and, uh, and you do feel full faster just because it is a smaller uh, tube. That sleeve surgery usually gives people about 25 to 35% or more than a quarter of their highest weight uh, off and stays off in a long-term fashion. Uh, it's a very good operation. It is very similar in terms of its impact to the old gastric bypass surgery, which was much more complicated and had uh, more risks in terms of uh, because it, it involved the small bowel, uh, more risk of kink uh, of the small bowel, and more risk of ulcers up here. And so sleeve does not. Um, the second operation that we offer is a combination of sleeve and a lower bypass operation, but it's a simpler bypass operation than the old gastric bypass. So that operation is called duodenal switch. So duodenal switch uh, is a sleeve gastrectomy plus we go just below the stomach on the small bowel, and this is a little hard to see, and there are better illustrations out there, but again, uh, for just our purposes for starting, we divide the small bowel right below the pyloric valve on the outlet of the stomach. And then the overall small bowel is around 30 feet long in most people. And this is the colon uh, where most digestion happens in the small bowel, and the colon actually just sort of concentrates the liquid that comes out of the small bowel so that we don't have liquid bowel movements. So we basically short circuit about 20 feet of the small bowel, we bring up a loop and connect it to that, that now divided bowel. So you now have about 10 feet where food goes down through the sleeve, out into the small bowel, and down about 10 feet of uh, small bowel before it hits the colon. And then bile and pancreatic juice go through this 20 feet of bowel so it doesn't have the, um, uh, it doesn't get um, stalled out. This bowel still works to bring fluid through and the fluid joins, uh, digestive juices join the food here and go down into the colon and then and then out eventually through the rectum as regular stool. So um, with both of these operations and with old operations and even if you're going to have your gallbladder out, their risk with any surgery, uh, mainly we worry 
uh, about blood clots in the leg and the lung uh, with any abdominal operation. People worry about leaks and bleeds. Those are much rarer. If you do have a bleed from one of these little points, it's usually in the first day after surgery, and we can usually just go back in with our tiny little incisions and put a stitch in. Now, it sounds dramatic to go back to surgery, but uh, as long as we get there in a reasonable amount of time, that's usually a very safe thing to do and often doesn't even delay discharge by, by a half a day. Uh, and that's less than one in a hundred people uh, now that have to go back to surgery for something like that uh, in the short run. Uh, then we also worry about long-term things and there's a slide later, I'm gonna put the slideshow in, that talks about gallstones and kidney stones that can happen in some people, uh, especially gallstones happen in a lot of people uh, these days. Um, and then uh, hernias, um, uh, there's, there's a long list of things that can happen but they're pretty darn rare. The main thing we worry about is blood clots. Now the benefits from surgery, and there's also a, a couple of slides for that, uh, the diabetes cure rate for a full duodenal switch is over 90% in our research uh, and in the published research. So that means, um, that means off of all medications and uh, most people who have been on insulin for less than 10 years are able to come off uh, all of their insulin. Not everybody, uh, but even those folks usually have a great deal of improvement. For duodenal switch, the weight loss that we see is usually more like 35 to 40 percent of total body weight or highest weight. Uh, that can uh, be true even for people who've already had a sleeve gastrectomy and then add the duodenal loop part of the duodenal switch later where their total weight loss from their original highest weight will be more like 35 or 40 percent. Now, you can do the math in between, and there's some complicated math out there that uh, has always confused even surgeons, even medical researchers, called excess body weight, and it is best just left alone. Really, total body weight is a better description of the way people lose weight, and it makes people not feel like there is some ideal weight that they need to be at. We just need to be healthier for the most part uh, and, and the mobility that comes with that. So we do not aim for a certain number or a certain amount of expected uh, uh, ideal weight. Uh, so total body weight loss is a better way to think about this. And it's not in the literature and it's not really on e even most of our uh, extra resources websites. So that can get confusing as you're doing your research. So preparing for surgery usually takes a couple of months. This is not the sort of thing we do quickly. Uh, you need to meet with our whole program, uh, especially the dietitian, and, our, and uh, have a um, mental health assessment. You need to meet with the surgeon. We need to make sure that your medical problems are tuned up as well as they can. My own surgery got delayed a couple of months while I got my blood pressure under control a little better. And uh, I was not happy with my primary doc for making me do that, but it made it safer and so it was the right thing to do. Um, so how does it work? So both of these operations basically make you feel less hungry and they make it easier to feel full with a regular meal. Now the first few months while you're recovering, you are not eating regular food. You transition into that as some of these tight tissues have to heal. If you think about having uh, uh, any other operation, there's a recovery period. But usually uh, within a few months, you're eating some regular food. Within a year, you're basically eating all regular food. Uh, you're not living on uh, uh, anything super special. You do need to take vitamins and get your vitamins checked forever. Uh, it makes it easier when your weight is down to exercise also to maintain a good muscle uh, mass and uh, that helps burn calories as well. And it's a lot less tempting to eat naughty food or to nibble between meals when you know you're going to feel full at mealtime. So that also really helps a lot psychologically in terms of the pressure that we often feel when we diet. The recovery from surgery is usually home the same day or the next day. We certainly don't kick people out of the hospital, but you'll be surprised uh, uh, how you're able to get out of the hospital very quickly or if you have it surgery at the surgery center uh, very quickly. We don't um, uh, have people have huge pain problems because we use a, a very uh, complicated sort of cocktail of medications while you're asleep and in your first 12 hours in recovery. And then we have uh, several different ways to minimize pain and uh, minimize nausea uh, in the few days after surgery. But it is still pretty slow recovery uh, in terms of that first week. So you will be, even though you're out of the hospital or out of the surgery center within a day, uh, you're usually out of work for at least a week, often a second week. Some people take a third week off, but um, not many. Uh, 
and then you do have a few months of transition back to sort of regular food, but you're eating some regular food usually within a month, uh, although it's uh, pretty soft to start with. The barriers to surgery for a lot of folks and the barriers to any kind of care, medical care or what have you, uh, are often shame and bias. People feel like they should be able to do it on their own. Actually, I felt that way. Uh, I had done diets before and they'd worked for me but then failed and I felt like I had failed the diets when really the, they had worked while I was on them, you just couldn't stay on them forever. And I call that boot camp. I mean, even Marines don't spend their whole career in boot camp and uh, that was tough. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings about historical, the, the way some of the old operations had risks that are now hugely minimized. Uh, they're, they're much less than they used to be. There's a lot of misunderstandings about the cost. People um, will, will sometimes hear stories, uh, again, from sometimes older surgeries or from big hospital chains that, that don't, aren't able to control costs, and so uh, they'll quote you a very high number. Uh, or what you read in the media. Then one of the, another barrier is your family uh, or your friends, uh, they love you and they're worried about any operation that you'll have and they hear those things and they bring those concerns in and, and they wanna bargain and say, please do anything but surgery. Uh, when in fact, the risk is higher for many, many folks, the risk is higher if they don't have surgery. So in terms of uh, wrapping this up a little bit, resources, things that you can go out and get additional information. Most people by the time they watch our information session have already done a lot of research, but don't let any particular thing that you hear stop you from at least coming in and getting a consultation. I think that's the most important thing is a one-on-one -on -one consultation uh, with a surgeon is important and uh, that's really what we wanna do here is reassure you that uh, this is worth investigating. You don't have to be committed to come in and talk to us. But some other resources, and I'll write them down here. Uh, let's see, I think we're good over here. Uh, so first of all, um, Obesity Action is the Obesity Action Coalition, and that has very good uh, online resources. That's .org. ASMBS.org is the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. Uh, and that has a lot of good uh, frequently asked questions and some nice videos. Um, uh, the best blogger on the internet is Shelly Vacari, and it's world according to eggface.com, uh, I believe. You may have to Google it. She's on all sorts of media, but she used to have, uh, uh, when they shared recipes, she had a skillet with two eggs for eyes and a bacon for a mouth. So that's how she got the word that they called her uh, egg face. Um, and then the, um, Weight Loss Surgery Podcast. You actually have to spell out the term Weight Loss Surgery Podcast. And I think that's dot .com. Uh, and that is Rieger. Cortell is the nurse practitioner who runs that. And that has lots of good audio as well. All right. So um, if you Google for that, uh, there's if you want to do more research. But again, please don't let research stop you from coming in and getting a one-to-one -one, uh, consultation with with one of us. There are um, bios, uh, videos of each of the surgeons elsewhere on our website at bmiut.com. Um, when you make an appointment, I think it's a great idea, please, to go ahead and fill out the portal online for your health history. That, may, that way we can, we can skip over the million questions to get to the important stuff so that we're not just uh, asking you about uh, what operation, you know, how old you were and you had your appendix out. It's already in the chart. Um, and then, uh, we really look forward to meeting with you and, and seeing you. We hope this is helpful, uh, and we look forward to getting a, a more professional um, information session up uh, very soon. Thank you for your attention.